Hello and welcome to another Hand Drink Solo Wine Info Report and today we're going to be recapping the salient points from the Tim Atkins South African Wine Report for 2022. The current issue is the 10th edition of the Tim Atkins South African Wine Report and I was lucky enough to get a chance not only to chat about what the last decade has held but also to look forward and find out about what excites him about the next decade for South African wine. While I was preparing for this interview, I was struck by what an incredible body of work that Tim has produced over the last decade. So we spent a little bit of time reminiscing about his early work. It's amazing, isn't it? it uh, and, and I just looked at the first one the other day and it was 80 pages and about 700 wines. So now I'm at 316 pages um, and 2,200 and something wines and um, nearly 100,000 words. I mean, it's, you know, there are novels that are shorter than that. Actually, War and Peace is probably shorter than that. Isn't it? <laughs> I look back 10 years ago, and the white wine of the year was the first vintage, believe it or not, of Cartology from Chris Alheim, 2011 vintage. And I spotted that out of the, you know, out of the blocks. I thought, this is amazing. So in other words, 10 years ago, Chris Alheim had just released his first wine. And I think, you know, we think a lot has happened since 1994, obviously, and, and the first democratic elections. But what's happened in the last decade has just been so much of an acceleration of, of quality. Ten years ago, Cinso wasn't taken seriously as, as a grape variety, as a cultivar. Uh, I think Syrah, the Syrah revolution, was just beginning. And I think that site-specific Chenin Blancs, again, you know, we're really at the beginning of that uh, ten years ago. Where we are now, particularly um, Chenin Blancs produced on, on granite soils, has just taken South African white wine to a completely new level. Now, for those of you who have read Tim Atkins' report before, you'll know that he worked very hard to unearth young talent in the South African wine industry. His efforts to shine light on our brilliant young winemakers has led to the discovery of people like Bernard Bridel or Elis Mafissa, or Lucas van Lagenberg, or Matt Day, many of whom have now gone on to become household names. But the question that kept puzzling me was, given all the financial constraints and economic challenges that keep on facing South African winemakers. What is leading these brilliant young minds in order to throw their lot in and embark on a fairly risky career in the South African wine scene? It's certainly not money, is it? Let's face it. I mean, nobody goes into wine, whether it be wine writing or, or wine selling or, or wine production, really, because they're expecting a big check at the end of it. I, I think one of the things about South Africa that, that makes it easier for those people to do it um, is this low entry, or low barrier to entry. Therefore, you know, it's pretty easy just to buy a few tons of grapes from somebody, you know, until comparatively recently from very good old vineyards. I mean, the competition for that now is potting up and rent a bit of cellar space somewhere, you know, in downtown Stellenbosch and make a wine and call it, you know, John O's wine or Tim's wine or whatever. And that's a really good thing. I mean, it's much easier to do that here than it would be in, say, California, you know, where grapes are much more expensive. Um, but the, the downside of that is it's actually much harder to sell wines from here at the prices they deserve. And, you know, the price differential between stuff that's actually pretty boring um, and stuff that's really starting to get quite interesting is very small which is great for consumers. It means that, you know, if you're willing to spend 15 quid or $20 on a bottle of wine from South Africa, you're going to get something pretty good. If you're willing to spend something like 40 pounds or 50, 60 dollars, you can get something that's world class. And you can't say that about many, many countries. But the downside of that is, as you said, it's actually quite hard for wine producers to make money out of it. Um, so, I mean, I think in the end, it's only worth applying, as it were, for the job if you're pretty passionate about what you're doing. And you look at all those guys and, and women, I'm using guys in the South African sense to encompass women as well as men, um, what they've achieved in the last 20 years, but certainly the last 10, it's remarkable. And, and you know, they're doing it because they're passionate about it, they love wine, they believe in wine, and that's why I do wine, that's why you do wine, um, because we, we're just passionate about the, about the subject uh, and, and about drinking it, you know, let's be honest. You know, it's fun. You know, wine is, wine is nice to drink. You know, people forget that. Now, I picked up on that assertion that for 50 or $60, wine lovers in the United States could pick up South African wines that are quite literally amongst the best wines in the world. But what has always puzzled me about this is that South African wines have, by and large, garnered the respect of wine critics and people in the trade around the globe. And yet, that respect has never really translated into big sales on international markets. I asked him if he thought he was seeing some shifts in the sentiments of the fine wine markets around the world. Sadly, you've still got a long way to go. And I, I think the American market is a very important market. And I don't think South Africa has yet 
crack the American market. I think it's it's cracked the, the, the London market, and the London market is only a bit of the UK market, obviously. Um, but you know, the, a lot of wines, and I wrote about this in a report, are being released at the moment through the Place de Bordeaux, which is the, you know, there's the Bordeaux trading system. And, and, and a lot of Bordeaux negociants are now selling wines from around the rest of the world, not Bordeaux, in September and releasing them. So, you know, the top Chileans and Argentinians and Italians and Spanish wines are all there. And South Africa's only got one wine there, and that's Santa Constance. Um, and, you know, I don't know, let's say there are 100 and probably 200 wines or something being released through the Place. Only one is South African. So maybe if Evan started selling his wines through the Place de Bordeaux, for example, or sold Columella, which he'd sell out in three minutes, two minutes, for 30 seconds, um, maybe that would make the difference. But I don't think he wants to. That's not really his kind of thing. So as we see, there are still no obvious changes for South African wine fortunes in the markets abroad. But I thought, what if, in a parallel dimension, Tim Atkin were to become some sort of wine marketer or wine salesman instead of a critic. I asked him what would be the single cultivar that he would take to the global markets in order to best give South African wine the chance of international financial success. I, I think it would be Chenin. You know, but, but I mean, the problem with doing Chenin is that white wines are much harder to sell to collectors unless it's white burgundy, than red. So you, maybe you'd have to go with reds and you might have to go Cabernet from Stellenbosch, I think. I mean, Syrah is also a difficult sell, um, particularly in the States. The people don't, you know, and I think it, part of that is down to Australia, that a lot of Australian Shirazes were, got very high points from the US critics, went into the US market and just collapsed in the bottle. Some of these wines have 16% alcohol with Britannomyces and they just fell over. And I think it put a lot of collectors and importers off. I mean, I think Syria is a very strong car for South Africa, but probably the way into that fine wine world is Stellenbosch. It's got a history and it would be Stellenbosch Cabernets and or Bordeaux blends. And, and in that I'd include, you know, Thai Bosch Crescendo, which is Cabernet Franc based. Um, I, I think that I think it's the Bordeaux varieties because those are the wines that have that have pull in the in the in the secondary market because of Bordeaux. So the Bordeaux model, and even though Bordeaux grape varieties are not necessarily my favourite grape varieties in the world, I think that's probably the way in. You know, I mean, someone like Mike Ratcliffe, who's not a fool um, from Villafonte, he knows that. You know, and I think that the way he's built Villafonte as a brand has used the 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 popularity and and the clout, if you like, of Bordeaux grape varieties to make that an in-demand brand, really. And of course, while that insight is useful in theory, can you imagine how boring the South African winelands would be if everyone ripped up everything that wasn't Chenin Blanc or Cabernet Sauvignon? After all, some of our most exciting wines, and especially some of the most exciting wines in the 2022 report, are made from niche cultivars like Tinta Barocca or Semillon or Tariga Nacional. So like, what a conundrum, right? Do we on the one hand lean into consolidation and simply plant the few cultivars that are internationally marketable, or do we lean into our rich diversity that enables South Africa to produce some incredibly exciting wines from these lesser known cultivars? I asked Tim to comment on where he sits on the spectrum between consolidation and diversity. I'm, I'm going to sit in the middle, basically. I'm on, I'm, 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 I'm on a fence and I can feel the splinters yeah. <laughs> in my backside. But um, I, I, I think you obviously you need that that you can't build an industry out of, you know, what a friend of mine called, you know, lesser spotted Gruner Veltlin or whatever, you know, it's, it's that you couldn't build a category on for now Pires or Videlia or whatever. But I think that th those things add, add interest. I mean, I was surprised to learn when I was doing the research for the report that the biggest selling export cultivar for South Africa by far yeah. is, is Sauvignon Blanc. You know, Sauvignon Blanc is, is the number one varietal. I mean, I, is Sauvignon Blanc a great, great variety in South Africa? I don't think so. I mean, there are a few good ones. Um, there are some great Sauvignon Semillon blends, but I don't think it's what South Africa does best at all. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and number two is, is anonymous red blends. That's the second most successful South African category. So that there's work to be done. So, you know, I think that all those things like, like Videlio, like Asiatico, like Alvarino, like Tariga Nacional, like Barbera, like Nebbiolo, Sangiovese, Tempranillo, all of those things add interest. And, and, and I think adding interest to a category is great for me, for you, for the geeks, yeah? yeah. But you're not gonna build brand South Africa, I agree, on those wines, because there aren't enough of them. And the major cultivars haven't really changed much in the last 20 years. You know, Shinan's still, what, 18% of what South Africa does. Um, the top varietals are the top varietals. And yeah. the, the changes may be Cabernet Franc, has, been, has become a bit more planted. I think Syrah's probably gone up a bit. 
Uh, Pinotage, surprisingly, I think has, has gone up a little bit. My short answer is it needs both. Ah, so Tim doesn't like our Sauvignon Blancs. But I couldn't just let him get away with that because I think it is one of our most exciting and dynamic cultivars. So I asked him to press a little deeper and talk more about the one or two South African Sauvignon Blancs that were really quite good. Well, I mean, I think there are five upstairs um, that we're going to taste later of the 195 wines that I thought were worthy of um, anointment, you know, um, <laughs> 195, you know, uh, 95 plus point, point wines. And they're from a mix of regions, actually. I mean, certainly I'm trying to think where they're from, actually. Um, Durbanville. Uh, there's one from Constantia, what Matt's doing at, at, uh, at Clen Constantia. Um, Trezan's wine, which is Sondag's Kloof. Um, I'm trying to think of the other two. Rainica, which is, which is Polka Dry Hills. So there's not really a, a single standout region. I think there's, there's one, must be one from Elgin as well. I can't remember whose wine it is. I should know that, shouldn't I? As it turns out, that fifth 95 plus Sauvignon Blanc was in fact the Thorn and Daughters Snakes and Ladders Sauvignon Blanc 2021 from the Citrus Gull Mountains. While David Nevot's Bowline Sauve Sem blend also scored 95 points. And in fact, there seemed to be a number of Sauve Sem blends that impressed him a little more than our straight Sauvignon Blancs did. But after I felt I'd pressed him enough on that, I moved towards some cultivars that more naturally excited him. Last year, Tim stuck his neck out and said that South African Shiraz Syrah was one of the most exciting and fast progressing cultivars in the land. So I asked him this year to drill down a little more and tell us where he felt the locus of all this new energy was coming from. There are probably I don't know, eight, ten producers of Syrah who I think are genuinely world class. I mean, they really are. And, and obviously, you know, we know who some of them are, um, whether it be, you know, um, certainly the Mullineaux, yeah, would, would be up there. And I think what Jean Smith is doing at, at Damascene is amazing. Uh, and I think that Lucas van Logrenberg and obviously Reen and Borman's wines at, uh, at Bosch Kloof with Epilogue are amazing. Reinecke, you know, Polka Dry Hills is kind of the epicenter of this little revolution, I would say. You know, it's, I mean, Selenbosch generally and the Swartland, I think, are the two great um, areas. But, you know, we're seeing there's one wine upstairs, which is a first from Bobby Wallace off the record, which is from Ceres Plateau. Yeah. And, you know, and in the past, Peter Valtz has made some great wines at Blank Bottle from Ceres Plateau. I think Ceres Plateau is going to be a really exciting Ceres area, particularly with, with climate change, which is, again, something I've talked about in the report. Yeah. These cooler areas. I think we're just seeing the beginning of, of Syrah. I think we're going to see some really exciting stuff. I mean, what's happening down in the Gullis Triangle, you know, the Strandfelt wines are, are pretty amazing. I mean, there's so many different styles. You know, what Peter Allen Finlayson's doing in Bot River at Gabrielle's Kloof, I think is really exciting. And especially seeing these soil-focused, terroir-driven Syrahs is super exciting. Interestingly, Tim also had some really encouraging things to say about South African Pinot Noir, which is not always echoed by our local critics. Pinot's pretty good too. Hannah Storm, who's got three wines upstairs and is a brilliant winemaker, he said that his best sales tool is he goes up to Joburg and he gets his, his agent rather to, 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 to put on a tasting of top, uh, top burgundies and he slips in a couple of his wines and his collectors come along and they go, OK, you know, let's have a taste of these. And they taste of these wines and, you know, get to the end and they suddenly find <laughs> not only have his wines done really well in the tasting, they're also like a fifth of the price. Um, and, th and those wines are stunning, you know, and it, I think if you look at what, you know, what Jessica Sauvine's doing, you know, with, with her wines, you know, Nom is a fantastic wine. So we're seeing new entrants to the, to the Pinot market, as well as the, the classics, which would be Cristal, I mean, obviously, and the Newton Johnsons and Hamilton Russell and, and uh, you know, Creation uh, and a few other people really in, in, in the Hemelinada, greater Hemelinada. I think it's a very exciting time for Pinot. Now, as I spent some time drilling down into his report, I noticed that a number of really high scoring wines were coming from vineyards that possessed genuine altitude, 500 meters above sea level and higher. I asked him if he thought that high altitude South African wines was a category that would emerge in the near future. Part of the problem with it is a lot of the people who own, who own the land, they tend to be farmers. And in those high areas, that tends to mean they're growing citrus. And it's obviously much more profitable to grow citrus probably five times well probably more probably ten sometimes um, and you find that even in places like Picanier's Cliff, you know that people don't make their money from grapes you know the Fancils for example they make wine from in money from from citrus and from from rooibos tea so that's one of the challenges but I think those areas particularly with climate change and I think it's for every hundred meters you go up it's a it's a degree centigrade cooler um, if these heat waves, the heat wave we saw between 15 and 
15, 16 and 19 occurs again, drought, um, where, you know, water's at a premium and, and the, the temperatures are just ridiculous. I mean, early this year, those four or five, you know, weekend heat spikes you had here um, were pretty scary, you know, and people saying they've never seen that before in the Swatland. Um, these four by four wines, you know, four pH and 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 four TA, you know, <laughs> total acidity. <laughs> Those are pretty blocky wines, right? So I think altitude is is one response to that. One of the things in the report is about climate change. The projections are pretty scary, you know, that if South Africa's going to be three degrees hotter on average now, in, uh, sorry, in 2050 than it is now, that's only 30 years away, you know, and that's pretty scary, and that could be at a point where all sorts of things are going to fail. You know, agriculture generally can become really hard. I mean, you may say, well, who cares about wine if people haven't got enough to eat yeah. or drink or drink? But, you know, for the time being, I think we can still shift things. And I think that, you know, planting on south facing sites, planting on clay or clay based soils rather than sandstone, you know, which is a hot thing and doesn't doesn't retain water um, are certain things that you can do you know the sort of canopies you use whether you're using bush vines the way they do with the Sirtico, you know in Greece um, I, th I think all of you know even the kind of crown approach that they use in, in, in on, on Santorini where you're protecting the bunches from sunburn I think all those things are, are, are part of the the, the, the future really uh, in inverted commas for South Africa Earlier in the week, I'd been digging through a few of Tim's older reports, and I noticed that Grenache Noir was one cultivar that he had highlighted in the past as something with immense potential. I asked him if, a few years later, he thought that Grenache in South Africa was living up to that potential that he'd spotted a few years ago. Well, I, I think the, the people, the really good people who are doing it, are still doing it. Uh, and so they tend to be Picaneers Kloof based or, or sourcing grapes from up there with those old vineyards that, that are pretty amazing. Um, bit in Bot River, you know, I think that what Marilise Neyman has done uh, uh, has been pre pretty amazing. Uh, uh, Memento, obviously Eben uh, with, with Soldat and the Sardis, the other Sardis, um, David and Nadia, great Grenache. Um, I'd like to see more, you know, and I'd like, it'd be great if the Molyneux got behind it, for example, you know, I, and um, I think it's such a, it's A, it's a brilliant grape variety. It would definitely be in my top 10 grape varieties in the world. It might even be in my top five. You know, I think Grenache is, is an amazing grape variety, but the problem is it doesn't yield massively, but it, but it does stand up to drought uh, and to heat. You know, it, it is the ultimate Mediterranean red grape variety. So, so please, anybody watching in South Africa, plant more. We need more in the ground. And of course, no conversation about South African wine is complete without at least touching on Pinotage once. I mentioned to Tim that I felt like Pinotage as the cultivar was going through some sort of adolescent identity crisis, where there are two very different styles that have emerged. There's the big, high alcohol, high tannin, ripe icon style Pinotage. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's the lighter, more ethereal, lithe Pinotage expression. My question to Tim was, can both these styles exist alongside one another? Or does South African wine need to pick one in order to enable it to be better understood by international markets? I think you could have, you could have different styles. I think you're seeing that with Syrah. Um, my personal view is that Pinotage is, is better suited to the, to the lighter style. You know, you look at its parents, its parents are, are Pinot Noir and Sanso, right? I mean, neither of those are great varieties that particularly like new oak or extraction. Doesn't mean you can't make that style. I, I'm, I'm more of a fan of, of the lighter, more elegant style, possibly with some whole bunch of fermentation, you know, using concrete eggs or whatever, or concrete fermenters, or just, just different things to lighten it up. But it doesn't mean there's not a market for that, for that big, bold, um, you know, slightly more Bayer's Kloofy style, um, or even Black Label, you know, from, from Canonco, but that's quite a big style, um, I think that's absolutely fine. I don't mind having a bit of diversity, but um, I know what you mean about it. It's a great variety that you sense that people aren't quite sure what to do with yeah. it. And I think that applies to, to consumers. You know, it's happened to Riesling as well. That The problem with Riesling is that people never know if it's going to be sweet or medium sweet or, you know, what or how high is the acidity going to be? And it's a bit confusing. And I think it's maybe a little confusing for that. Yeah. 
To finish off, I shifted away from wines and wine making to ask Tim who he thought were some wine growers that were emerging as real talents in South Africa's culture of Vineron. As I said earlier, he's always been so good at unearthing young talent, and I wondered if viticulture wasn't perhaps an area that he could shine his light on a little bit more. To be honest, I haven't talked to that many growers this year. Yeah. Um, and I tend to see people who are, who are growers who also make their own wines, right? Um, and I would like to see, I mean, we, it's a sad fact that South Africa is losing growers, basically. Um, I suppose that Danny Karinas would probably be, I, mean, I don't know how old he is, he's not that old, is he? Carrie Bibb, how old, it, it's, Joshua. yeah, how old's Joshua? Um, I think those would be examples. I think what's interesting, it, and the project that excited me a lot, was the new Reineke project. I don't know if you've seen that in the Polka Dry Hills, which is just unbelievable you know I mean it's it's Vinnie Mark as opposed to Reineke in a way really but that's what Sheldon Van Veek who's my um, viticulturist of the year uh, is involved in planting with Rosa Kruger and, and Eddie um, the famous Eddie who does the contouring Bosman I think he's called right. yeah he's supposed to be a, a legend um, so I think you know I, I would like to more growers I'd like to spend more time with growers um, you know, uh, and, and, and chat to them. But I think a lot, it, growing is not something people are going into, growing grapes. Well, you know, if anything, they're pulling them out. Yeah. Uh, and you can see why people are not necessarily investing in that at the moment, unless they've got the money of a Vinnie Mark behind them, really. And I think it's important that the best, best producers give credit to the growers, you know. Um, I suppose, you know, maybe Barsi's, Barsi's son, uh, you know, has taken over from Barsi. I don't know, Hank Lang sadly passed away this year. Um, both on Citrus Star Mountain, and I think Hank, there's a succession plan there um, that one of his children or his wife is going to take over, which, which is great. Okay, so that's all for today, but I highly recommend buying your own copy of the Tim Atkin Report and really getting to grips with all 100,000 words of it. You can order it straight from his site at timatkin.com. I'll also leave a link to Tim's web shop for anyone who's interested in digging deeper into the essential work that Tim is doing to bring a sense of focus to the richly diverse South African wineries. <laughs>